Hallelujah. 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 That's a pure word right there. Breaks every language barrier. Oh, Ramamamasa. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Mm. Hallelujah. Lord, I bless you. Moshandereva Bababakota Rossi Terebreshe. Devil thought he could take us down and he lost. Satan thought he could destroy your testimony, and God said, I'll one up you, devil. I'll give him a greater testimony. Enemy thought he could take us out with sickness and disease, and God healed and restored us. I hope somebody relates to some of that I just said. Amen. Buddy, when I get to testifying about what God brought me through, it's hard to stay on the program. Last Sunday night, we had us a testimony service, and I'm telling you, it fired me up hearing what God has done in your lives. Hallelujah. He's still God, bro. Sometimes when you're sick in body, it's a little harder to lift up the hand and praise him. But you know, that's when I found I pushed through the hardest. Lifted something too heavy for me Monday and I hurt my back years ago and it gets stronger and I'm okay but sometimes if I lift too much weight it kind of knocks me down for a few days I lifted a wheelbarrow with probably two to three hundred pounds at least of sand in it wet sand and I felt it within the hour and I was by, by the next morning I was rolling out of bed and unable to go to work and when I would roll over I wasn't instantly healed like I wished but when I would roll over off the bed and I felt that pain go uh, at my lower spine down into my hip area. And I said, by your stripes, by your stripes, I already have been healed. You know what? Five minutes later, I wasn't what you'd think healing would be. I wasn't healed as far as uh, a diagnosis or what I felt. But when the pain would hit again, I'd say, by your stripes. See, I got something to shout about today. Because even when things were awful and pain hit us and hit me, 
I was still praising him. And I was saying, thank you, God, for all the times you've healed me in the past. Lord, you've not lost your power. Thank you for touching me, Lord God. For some reason, I'm needing to share this testimony today because there are others in this room that have said, God, why am I not healed yet? And I don't have the answer for you except to say this, that if you'll praise him when it gets the roughest, if you'll shout his name or whisper his name when you don't feel like hardly saying the name of your own child, but if you'll speak the name of Jesus Christ, there will be power that rises up in you and your faith level will reach the mountaintops. Not because God does what you ask right then, but because you've proven faithful when you felt nothing but pain. you proved faithful faithful when you felt nothing but sickness and disease and bad diagnosis and doctors telling you there's no hope but oh I can't promise you today you'll leave here healed even though I hope you will but I can promise you this that if you'll start praising the name of Jesus Christ through your pain if you'll praise him through your crisis if you'll praise him when it feels like people hate you and they're talking about you but you say God you don't hate me you love me if you'll praise him through the valley then I promise you when you get to the mountaintop you'll have a God there who smiles and says, I'm well pleased with you. How about we pray? <clears throat> Let's pray. Mighty, holy God. My God, I pray in the name of your son, Jesus, that, Lord, you would move the way you want to move in this service. Lord God, I know that you've given me a word for the hour, and I pray, God, you help me to deliver it accurately and with the right spirit and heart, and that, Lord, you would move upon your precious people today, move back in our children's ministry service today. God, and thank you that souls are going to be saved, sanctified, and filled with the Holy Ghost, bodies healed, and minds delivered, we pray. In the name of Jesus Christ, would you just say his name with me? Jesus. Would you say it one more time? Jesus. He's still the way, the truth, and the life, Jake. There's no other name given uh, among men by which we must be saved except the name Jesus. Damien, I'm thankful for that name that gets me through every situation that I face. CPR is the title of today's message. Some would look around and say, man, I felt like they, some of them, uh, our church folks might need a little CPR. <laughs> CPR stands for church pray for revival and not, in 1740 the paris academy of sciences officially recommended mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation for drowning victims by 1903 over 160 years later dr george creel performed the first successful use of external chest compressions in order to resuscitate a person in 2008, the American Heart Association has recommended hands-only CPR for adults. There's been a lot of changes involving CPR, which stands for cardiopulmonary resuscitation. No wonder we use the initials. Amen. <coughs> Get stuck saying that. Cardiopulmonary resuscitation. You want to try it? Cardiopulmonary. You ready? Cardiopulmonary resuscitation resuscitation you did it good job Randall and Hope look at y'all look at you I believe that the church needs a call to prayer for revival Amen. we can choose two different directions we can choose to sit in our pews and be satisfied with where we are spiritually we can laugh at good jokes from the pulpit and we can get warm, fuzzy feelings from cute stories that the pastor or teacher would share. We can choose that. We can choose to believe that we're just fine spiritually and we'll continue living our lives the way we always have until Jesus returns. Or we can decide to finally do what we were born to do. Is anybody in this room born to do something greater than you're doing right now? Do you believe you're born to do something greater than what you're doing right now? That's exciting. We can choose to be a light that confuses darkness and forces the demonic powers to retreat. And we can choose to be the fiery, hot Pentecostal church that God told us we were supposed to be when he established New Haven Church of God in Southside, Alabama. But it is a choice. 
And we have the free will to make that decision. I, as your pastor, am choosing revival. I am choosing that we will stand for what's right. I'm choosing holiness. And I believe that you stand with me today. Can I get an amen? amen. Isaiah chapter 57, our first scripture today. Isaiah 57, verse 15. For thus says the high and lofty one who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. If you really want revival, church, then you've got to go back to what the old time saints used to preach. Oh. Holiness, Amen. without which no man shall see the Lord. I dwell in the high and holy place with him who has a contrite and humble spirit to revive. Somebody say revive. revive. The spirit of the humble and to revive. Say revive. Revive. The heart of the contrite ones. God has a certain way he likes things done. And in this scripture, he plainly tells us that those he revives are the people who were already contrite and humble. He didn't say, I'm going to come and revive you. Then you will become contrite or broken. And then you will become humbled. No, he said, I've come to revive those who already have made a decision before they felt the Holy Ghost. Now, I know this is Old Testament, but I'm making it modern here. I'm coming to revive the ones before that they, before mama has said that special prayer that gives them goosebumps or before they heard their favorite song on their MP3 or their phone hooked into their car on the road. Or maybe you still got CDs and tapes, hallelujah. But before you do that, he says, I want somebody broken and contrite and humbled before I can revive them. See, too many people get so excited and they can hardly wait till we uh, set up a revival and we've got the best, hottest, uh, youngest or whatever preachers, well-known preachers that come and they get on this stage and they preach and there's about 50, 60 people who don't even go here that show up and that's fine. I love having them. But they'll come up and, and sometimes they don't come back. That's okay. But too many people get all caught up in a revival like that where that you got big names on the uh, brochures and you put it all out on Facebook. You create an event. Get everybody prepped up. We're all wearing our nicest outfits. That's great. But God says, that's not the type situation where I'm wanting to send revival. He says, I'm looking for someone who's broken. I'm looking for someone who's not caught up in their agenda, not worried about what people think about them as far as how uh, they look up to them or respect them, not looking for those kind of people. I'm looking for someone who cries out when no one's around and says my name and prays over individuals when no one knows it. I'm looking for someone who will live a life of integrity and honor unto me when no one but I can see them. That's who God's looking for. He says, I, I'm going to send revival, but it's coming to those who humble themselves. Brother Gary, there's been people you and I both know that have come through just this ministry that refuse to humble themselves during their short stay here at this church. And because of that, they might have been used a little bit, but they were never fully able to flow in their gift and calling because they refused to humble themselves before God and before whoever the Lord had over them. Some people come in and they try to tell us what to do. They try to tell the pastor what to do. And God said this, and if you don't agree with it, you're in the flesh, pastor. And I'm like, well, brother, let's pray. Let's, I, I mean, I don't just rebuke them usually. I, I just say, let's pray about that and let me, let me tell you how I feel then. I try to be kind and loving. Yeah. But God says the only way I can truly send revival, at least in this verse, is if you're broken and if you humble yourself before him. Why do we need revival? Here's some of the reasons, and some of them apply to you. Because God has given some of you visions in the past, and you have almost forgotten them. We need revival because God has given some of us dreams, and because a few years have passed by and those dreams have not taken place, we have almost given up on distant dreams. We need revival because there are things you and I have hoped for that we've almost lost hope for. And finally, we need revival because it's far too easy for our hearts to grow cold because of life in general. And maybe things don't go our way. And maybe our bodies hurt. And maybe our finances are uh, not where they need to be. And we're struggling to pay bills. There's all kinds of reasons. Maybe our children are having trouble in school or maybe they're sick. 
Whatever the reason, it's easy sometimes to get a cold heart. Merriam-Webster defines revival as this. A restoration of force or effect to return to consciousness or life, become active and flourishing again. That's pretty powerful. I want to stand before you today and let you know something great. That you were created with a purpose. You sit on the chair this morning because God put a purpose inside you and you feel driven to discover that purpose and to walk in that purpose. Your purpose is not some uh, careless thought that God had when he was sitting on his throne and designing you and saying, well, I've, I've put a whole lot of work into Hayden over here, but now that I've got to, uh, now that I've got to Colton, I'm just going to throw these few things together and we're going to maybe just slide by with Colton. You never have to worry about God doing that because God always designs you for greatness. If you're not great yet, get ready. You're about to be. Hallelujah. Somebody give the Lord a clap of praise. If you're not great yet, you're about to be. And I'm not talking about building people up in the flesh. I'm talking about standing up against giants that have tormented you for the last 15 years and you don't think you're ever going to whip them because your flesh continues to give in. My Lord, I'm preaching right now. And the Lord's trying to tell somebody you might not have been great against that giant for 15 years or longer or maybe less. But I, God sent me to tell Tell somebody in this church that you're about to become great in his sight and you're going to whip that devil and you're going to take that giant down and those things that have tried to destroy your home, your marriage, your life, your mind, your heart, your walk with God, they are going to be taken down with the stone of your faith and you're going to start slinging that thing that God gave you, put it in that pouch and let it fly and God will help you take down that giant. Hallelujah. Well, praise the Lord. We need revival. Amen. Why else do we need revival? Because people are depending upon us. Believe it or not, just in this room, there are over one million people depending on just the people in this room. That's from the Lord. There are over one million. I could go higher. There are over one million people connected with this small group over the next several years, if the Lord tarries, that God wants to put you in contact with to transform their lives. Some of, you, you'll, some of them you'll never meet. Some of it will happen because of uh, a Facebook post or a Twitter or something that you put online, and there'll be people over uh, in other parts of the world. You'll never know they read your post, and it'll change. Woo, God. It's going to change their lives. Because it won't just be your words. It'll be words planted in you by the Holy Ghost. And God will use you. I believe we'll go farther than that. I think there'll be some people in this room who will travel overseas. And who will minister to thousands of individuals. And there will be multitudes healed and saved and baptized. But it begins with a hope. It begins with a seed that I'm planting in you from the Holy Ghost today. That's saying it will only happen if you receive it and allow it to grow in you. That hope that I'm speaking right now, it'll get you fired up and you say, thank God there's going to be millions coming to Christ. But right now it's just a seed, but you've got to let it cultivate. You've got to be willing when people tell you it can never happen. You've got to be willing to hold on and say, but God. Mm, but God said differently. We need revival. We've got two choices. We can remain complacent, not say a word, leave people alone, be quiet. Or we can do what we were born to do as Christians, born again to do. And that is to keep spreading this gospel to every person on the planet has heard the word that Jesus is Lord, died on a old rugged cross, and he rose from the dead so that we could be saved for all eternity. I want to give you some famous quotes about revival. <clears throat> Billy Sunday, American evangelist in the early 1900s. He said this, A revival does two things. First, it returns the church from her backsliding. And secondly, it causes the conversion of men and women. And it always includes the conviction of sin on the part of the church. What a spell the devil seems to cast over the church today. Andrew Murray, he was a Dutch evangelist to South Africa in the late 1800s. He said this, the coming revival must begin with a great revival of prayer. Do you believe that? Amen. I do. It's in the closet. 
with the door shut that the sound of abundance of rain will first be heard. An increase of secret prayer with ministers will be the sure harbinger of blessing. Leonard Ravenhill, famous evangelist, he said the man who can get believers to praying would under God usher in the greatest revival the world has ever known. John Wesley said a revival is no more a miracle than a crop of wheat. In any community, revival can be secured from heaven when heroic souls enter the conflict determined to win or die, or if need be, to win and die. And finally, Charles Finney said revival is renewed conviction of sin and repentance, followed by an intense desire and obedience to God. It is giving up of one's will to God in deep humility. And now I want to share with you the text that God led me to when he wanted me to preach about revival today. <clears throat> it's found in Judges chapter 15. It's a story about a man who you would think of more in a sense of a wrestling match or kickboxing or some action movie. But really don't think that much about Samson when you hear the word revival. So I want to show you what the Lord showed me. And I don't plan on finishing this till tonight, but I'll at least get started. Judges chapter 15, verse 14 reads, When he came to Lehi, the Philistines came shouting against him. How many of you know sometimes your enemy sure has a way of getting loud and getting in your face? Do any of you have that invisible barrier that when people cross, come on, Jade, you know it. When, when people cross that barrier that's about two feet and they get close to your face, that something happens and something comes out of you that you didn't know was in you. You ever heard that phrase, get out of my face? You know, that, there's just that barrier. Brother Gary's got one. He knows it. There's, there's a barrier people can cross, and it's like, oh, you better step back right now. <clears throat> I bet Brother Jim, when he was younger, <clears throat> when Jim was, he probably still got one, but when Jim was younger, I guarantee you don't get right here on Jim and start cussing him out. <clears throat> now, a sergeant might have, or a drill sergeant, that might have happened, but that's about it. Don't you cross that invisible barrier. Guess what Samson's enemies did? They came shouting. They came with that roar of victory, thinking they're about to have the captive that has tormented them. Then the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him, and the ropes that were on his arms became like flax that is burned with fire, and his bonds broke loose from his hands. Now, before we get too far with the story, I really want to explain something. Guess who tied Samson up? You think, oh, it must have been the Philistines. They tied him up or either hired somebody to do it, and then they went and got the whole army and came after him. Guess who tied up Samson? His own people, the Israelites. You see, the Israelites were servants to the Philistines during this time. And God would use certain judges to raise up and give them relief for a short time. Samson was born to bring relief to Israel and deliverance to Israel from the Philistines. But the Israelites had grown almost comfortable with captivity. Can I get an amen? amen. I've seen, Colton, way too many church people who have become comfortable with captivity. They look around at a deacon or they find a, a worship team member and they, they say, well, they're bound by this. They look at somebody in children's ministry or youth ministry, student ministry. They, they say, well, well, they've got issues. They're bound by certain things. I'm not saying they should be. I don't think I'm condoning it, but here's where, where I'm going. That we look at others and we compare ourselves to them instead of comparing ourselves to God. Now, we can't ever be God, but, but you are settling for less if you compare yourself against another human instead of against holiness itself. God is our standard, not people. People will fail. They'll sin. They'll do wrong. They'll speak words they shouldn't. But that does not give us an excuse to do the same. They were comfortable with their captivity. And they looked at Samson as one who might cause the, the heavy load to get heavier because the Philistines might start taking away more of their property and might steal some of their kids as slaves. Samson, just settle down and be quiet. Samson, behave. 
Don't cause us any more trouble. I, we know the anointing's on your life, but can't you conform to the way the rest of us act for just a little while? Don't you understand, Samson, that you're causing problems in my home and you're stirring up folks? Don't, don't you understand my little kid's buying the Samson action figures and, and he's killing little lions with action figures and, and you're stirring up something in him that's never going to happen, Samson. Just be still. Quiet down. Quit stirring up stuff. And they tied him up with their own ropes, not that of the enemy. I want you to know that I fully believe there's some Samsons in this room. I believe there's some people that folks have talked to you to a point where they almost beat you down. And they told you that you need to just settle down with your religion. You need to settle down with your talking in tongues. You know, sometimes I go around people and they don't believe in baptism of the Holy Ghost. And I try to respect their beliefs. But you better believe that in a kind way, I am glad to share what the Bible says. I was about to say what I believe. But what the Bible says about the gifts of the Spirit doesn't bother me. I, I want them to ha have a taste, a desire for more of God. Now, I'm not going into a fan. But we've got to be careful because some people will beat us down. And you know, there's some people who even, who even come to Pentecostal churches and they're afraid to tell their friends they go to one. Because one of the first things they hear is, do you handle snakes? I still hear that. I'm like, well, in the spiritual realm, I guess. I, I, I uh, trampled on a couple of demons last week. <laughs> well, praise God. Woo. My Lord. Hey, some of y'all brought some stuff in with you before, and we've had to get it dealt with. Can I get an amen? We had to handle some snakes. They just weren't physical snakes. No. I leave that to the gardeners and whoever else wants to. Animal control. People will bind you up with their own expectations and their own demands when God's saying, but I called you to be liberated. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Please. Understand in this church, yes, there's order. Yes, we go by the Bible. But you do not have a pastor or leaders in this church who are just looking for somebody to try to sit down because they're getting out of order. We don't have a, a group sitting there, a panel with, with clipboards and pens saying, oh, there's two marks against that one. They, they jumped up too high. Oh, they, that, that's the fourth time they've lifted their hands in the last five minutes. That's four marks. You don't have to worry about that. You know, I've, I've talked with people even recently. They said, you know, if you raise your hand in a certain service that they attended, they said you'd been out of order. I thought, how sad. Was it a funeral? No, I'm just kidding. That's talking about church. I was like, how sad. That's awful. Are you glad to be in a church where the Holy Ghost can move? Amen. Amen. I'm not trying to talk about other churches. As a matter of fact, I didn't name any. But I am here to say that I believe that you need to be in a place where you're free According to the order of the word, of course. I don't mean you run up here and grab them out and say, Pastor, I'm supposed to preach this morning. Well, if the Lord gave me a word, you're probably out of order. Amen. So I'm not talking about that. But I'm saying when God moves on you, and we're all flowing in the Holy Ghost, that please understand you're free to worship in this place. Amen. They tied him up themselves because they wanted him to sit down and be quiet. What a sad state this must have been. But there was only one problem, Jake. The problem was that Samson was anointed. You see, it's hard. John Isaac, it's hard to tie up somebody for long when the anointing's dripping off of them. See, Samson might have allowed him to tie him up for just a short time, but there came a point where things got hot. The Bible says those cords became like flax burned by fire. I'm here to tell you right now that there's things people have tried to put on us, and I'm not trying to cause any division between other denominations, Pentecostal, but I'm just here to tell you right now that in these last days, God said, I'm going to pour out my spirit on all flesh. You know what that means? That means Methodist, Episcopalian, Presbyterian, Baptist, Catholic, Anglican, Church of God, Church of Christ, Assembly of God, anything thing that you can come up with. He says if somebody's hungry in that church, they might be wearing a robe and have a 50 member choir but if somebody gets hungry, I'll break out in that church a tradition with a move of the Holy Ghost. It might be a church that's meeting in a, in a living room and all they've got is a recliner, a TV and a couch and a Bible study but if somebody in that group of five gets hungry for a move of God, he'll send revival on their street in their living room right there in their midst. It's because he looks for hearts that are contrite, broken and humble and I believe we have that here today Samson he, he saw himself that those 
cords became like melted flax, and he broke them off. What else ties us up, Pastor? Sometimes we tie ourselves up. How do we do that? One way we do it is with our own expectations of what God's supposed to do. We tie ourselves up, get ourselves boxed in. Because we say, well, I just know when I've went around telling people God's going to do this today. Now, I'm not saying it, God told you. I'm saying you just feel it. God's going to do this. He's going to do that. And when it doesn't happen, we get ourselves tied up and boxed in, and now we're mad because God didn't do what we said he was supposed to do. And now people look at us and say, well, I'm not sure if they're legit or not. I think there's a little bit of false prophet going on over there. And, and now you feel uh, like you've lost the respect of the people. There's all kind of crazy feelings. That's one way we can tie ourselves up. Another way is with our schedules. Come on, get with me. We can get so busy and so booked up that we hardly have time even to pray. How sad it is when life has got us so bogged down and we're, we get so deeply even in debt that we have to work almost seven days a week just to pay for our debts. And it's sad. And that's not what God wants for us. He wants us to be free and to be able to flow and to have more time. I pray God will give us creative ideas in this building. That the Lord will bless some of you to become self-employed entrepreneurs in Jesus' name. I pray that he'll give you thoughts of inventions to where that you can uh, make the money you need and be free to have more time to work for him. And if he decides you're going to go a different route, I pray God will start showing you some things to cut out of your schedules. To make room for God. Amen. I'm here to tell you right now, I've got three girls. One's out of the house, two are in the house. Three grandbabies a wife, a business, I'm pastoring, it's easy to get busy. Amen? And sometimes I just have to let them know there's certain times of the week where I will come to this church and I'll say, nobody bother me. I'm, I won't even have my phone on me. It's going to stay in that office. And I'll say, I've got to get along with God. And I believe regardless of who you are, what position you hold, there are times you've got to do the same thing. Amen. It might be in a bedroom or a bathroom or a closet. Or a garage, it doesn't really matter, a vehicle. But somebody's got to get serious about wanting more of God. Amen. And why is that? Because last night, and I'm just pulling a number out of the hat, don't think that I read the news, but last night at least three people in America died and went to hell. Now there's probably a lot more than that, but I'm safe by just sticking with three. At least three people in America died and went to hell last night. There are multitudes every day who die and do not know Jesus. I have heard of more deaths in the last year than I think almost my whole life. As far as people close to us, local, I'm like, what is going on? And what's really worse to me is when it's suicide and people take their life. And we don't condone suicide. God doesn't either. And we don't beat people up, the families, if, if that's what happens to their, their uh, loved one. But we certainly try to tell people the truth that God speaks life, and he's the only one who has the right to give and to take uh, in that situation. So just so you know where your pastor stands, suicide's wrong based on the word. And what I say uh, from what I have learned is that if they're out of their mind, if they've lost their mind, uh, God judges them based on where they stood with him before they lost their mind. If they're on some kind of prescription medicine, and they, it has completely altered their understanding where they were before they were getting in that situation. Spiritually, that's where I believe God judges their soul because he always looks on the heart. And sometimes the flesh can interfere with the soul, especially when drugs are involved. But I leave that up to the Lord to know where they were the last moment that they were in their right mind. But I do say, if you ever feel that urge to... End your life and things will get better. I want you to rebuke that in the name of Jesus. And let the enemy know that he's defeated and, you, and God's already spoken life over you. In Jesus' name. I wonder if anybody's sitting before me right now who is desperate for God. Isn't it easy to get a little cold sometimes? Isn't it easy to go a few weeks and maybe you don't flow in a certain gift God has given you and you start thinking, well, maybe God's just going to use somebody else so I can just kind of slide by. 
Isn't that easy to think that way? But see, ever so often God gives you pastor a word like today and lets you know he's not satisfied with that thinking. That he wants a fiery, hot church. A church where every time we come in the door, somebody's getting saved or delivered or healed. A church where lives are being changed every week. Hmm. Well, I got some stuff I got to share. I'm going to try to hurry. Verse 15, he found a fresh jawbone of a donkey. Now, this is when the Philistines had come upon him. He had broken off those cords. He found a fresh jawbone of a donkey, reached out his hand and took it and killed a thousand men with it. Then Samson said, with the jawbone of a donkey, heaps upon heaps, with the jawbone of a donkey, I have slain a thousand men. If I were to go down a road today and I saw the carcass of a possum, I'm going to think, first of all, ooh. Second of all, I'm going to think death. I'm not talking about, oh, it's a sign, somebody's going to die. No. I'm saying I would think that that carcass was once a living animal, and now it's dead. Amen. It means something when you see a skull or a jawbone. Everyone who would have passed by this jawbone of a donkey would have probably thought death. That used to be a part of a donkey, but now it represents death death but Samson saw something different in it because of the anointing on his life he saw it as a tool to take out 1,000 of his enemies and here's what I want to remind you of that there are some things and we're gonna go old school for just a minute Neil so stay with me but there are some things about the past that people have laid down and let die they've almost given up on fasting I would dare say that in most churches probably people go an entire year and never even hardly think about fasting unless their pastor were to say let's fast as a church and then even if they're asked to do that they might fit in once in a month to even do so I pray to the Lord that people are honoring their oath and their vow to pray and fast once a week over the awakening. And here's one reason why. Number one, because you made an oath. Number two, because I tell people you're doing it. I let city council members know we're calling out your name. We're praying and fasting for you every day of the week. I let teachers know when I get to speak in front of the schools. I say we're praying and fasting over you by name every day of the week. And if you're not part of the Southside Awakening, I pray you will get with me before the end of the day and say, Pastor, what do I need to do to be part of it? And it's as simple as going online to newhavencog.org, going to connect, and you'll find Southside Awakening. And one day a week, you skip one meal, and you pray over that entire list. It's also on Facebook. But I encourage you to be part of that. That's something bigger than New Haven. It's something bigger than us. Yeah. He found something that looked dead, and God took it to destroy the enemy. Fasting. What's the big deal about fasting? Because it kills some of that flesh that you're dealing with, and you can't figure out why you can't get over certain things. It's because sometimes you need to fast. It's not always a solution for everything, but I believe the old-time saints knew what they were talking about when they said, Michael, sometimes you're just going to have to fast, son. Sometimes praying ain't going to get it, boy. You're going to need to push the plate away. That's the way they always said it. I guess that's why I say it when I preach. Push the plate back. They say, Michael, there's going to be days in your life you will have to push the plate away and fast and pray while you're fasting. They didn't say fast and watch Tom and Jerry or watch Simon and Simon or Magna P.I. Dukes of Hazard back then. Some of you lived in the 80s. You know what I'm talking about. They didn't say that. They said you're going to have to fast. And when you're fasting, you actually pray. And I have found, Neil Watts, that there is power gained through fasting because part of my flesh dies that I didn't know was ready to die. I didn't know it was going to die. But as I fasted and gave up a part of that flesh that desires to feed itself, I was actually making my flesh know something. That flesh, you're no longer going to dictate to my spirit what I'm going to do. Flesh, you're not going to tell me how I'm going to live anymore. Your impulse, my God, your impulses will not drive my soul to sin. Because I am telling you now, flesh, my spirit man is rising up over you. And you are now under dominion of the Holy Ghost and of my own free will. Fasting will do it. But if you're going to kill a thousand Sometimes you've got to pick up a jawbone that looks dry and everybody's walking by and all they see is death in the past and no prospect of ever being used again. Amen. It's just there taking up space. 
Oh, but you get it in the hands of somebody anointed, somebody filled with faith, and you'll kill a thousand. What else lies by the wayside that so many Christians nowadays just ignore? How about holiness? How about the fact that we're supposed to live according to the Bible and not according to what the television past preacher says or the president or anybody else? We don't go by the standard of people. We are to live holy as unto the Lord. And there are going to be things, I'm repeating myself from the past, but there will be things God asks you to do that he will not ask of the person uh, that you speak to about every other day. And you're going to wonder why, and God's going to tell you, don't worry about them besides praying for them. Don't worry about what I tell them because I'm dealing with you. And when you start listening to me and giving up what I tell you and start doing what I ask, then maybe I'll use you to speak to that person. Maybe not. But the fact of the matter is holiness involves a very personal walk with God and there are things you have to let go of and let fall off of you that you sure like right now and you 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 wouldn't dream a year ago of letting it go but because you got hungry for God and there's a thirst in you you're feeling that you can't explain to your mother you can't explain to your uh, cousins or your friends you just know it's like there's something inside you and there's an itch and you can't hardly scratch it but every time you get around Pentecostal preaching every time you get in the holy word of God every time you get in the prayer room or when somebody anointed lays their hands on you you feel like that's being eaten and you say this is what I'm craving there's a lot of jawbones lying along the path that look like they should be discarded and we don't need it anymore but God says I'm going to use that old thing that looks dead and if you'll put it in an anointed hand which is your hand he said I'll use it to destroy the very enemy that mocks you every day but you, you've got to make a decision to get free of the bonds of your own schedules and to get free of the bonds of expectations or even complaints against your worship or people griping because of this or that about you and say, but this is really a one-on-one -on -one thing with me and Jesus and I've got to be revived because if I'm not, I feel like I'm going to die. Thank you, Jesus. I don't know what time it is, but I've got to share at least one more thing. Thank you, Jesus. What does a thirsty church look like? Let me give you some examples. And boy, I would love to see this right here. Jade, a thirsty church for God is one where the pastor shows up about 30 minutes early as usual. And there are people lined up at the door waiting on him to open it so they can get in. That's a thirsty church. A thirsty church, on the other hand, is when the head usher is waiting around and he's thinking, well, it's about time to lock up. And he looks into the sanctuary and there's still 13 people, 14, 15. Oh, there's another 16. And he overlooked some of them because they were under the chairs. Crying, seeking, hungry for God. That, Brother Randall, is what a thirsty church looks like. And the head usher has to say, well, I guess I'll be here for about another 30 minutes or more because somebody's seeking God. A hungry church is one where the pastor stands up and says, we need to start praying and fasting. And one by one, people contact him. They don't do it in front of everybody, but they contact him saying, Pastor, the Lord already moved on me last week to start fasting before you said it. That's what a thirsty church looks like. One that's hungry for God. And a hungry church is one that craves God so much that they want to make Him happy. They want Him to rejoice when they are in His presence. And one of the ways we make God rejoice is by bringing folks with us and saying, you've got to feel what I feel. You've got to hear the word that I've been hearing on Sundays. You've got to come be a part of my class on Wednesdays that I've been a part of. We, you've got to see what I'm seeing. Contagious Christianity is like that, Brother Jim. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for your guidance.